The Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade Truth is stranger than fiction. Old Saying Having had occasion lately, in the course of some Oriental investigations, to consult the Tell Me Now Is It So or Not, a work which, like the Zohar of Simeon Zochiades, is scarcely known at all, even in Europe, and which has never been quoted to my knowledge by any American, if we accept perhaps the author of the Curiosities of American Literature, having had occasion, I say, to turn over some pages of the first-mentioned very remarkable work, I was not a little astonished to discover that the literary world has hitherto been strangely in error respecting the fate of the vizier's daughter, Scheherazade, as that fate is depicted in the Arabian Nights, and that the denouement there given, if not altogether inaccurate, as far as it goes, is at least to blame in not having gone very much farther. For full information on this interesting topic, I must refer the inquisitive reader to the Is It So or Not itself. But in the meantime, I shall be pardoned for giving a summary of what I there discovered. It will be remembered that in the usual version of the tales, a certain monarch, having good cause to be jealous of his queen, not only puts her to death, but makes a vow by his beard and the prophet to espouse each night the most beautiful maiden in his dominions, and the next morning to deliver her up to the executioner. Having fulfilled this vow for many years to the letter, and with a religious punctuality and method that conferred great credit upon him as a man of devout feelings and excellent sense, he was interrupted one afternoon, no doubt at his prayers, by a visit from his grand vizier, to whose daughter, it appears, there had occurred an idea. Her name was Scheherazade, and her idea was that she would either redeem the land from the depopulating tax upon its beauty, or perish, after the approved fashion of all heroines, in the attempt. Accordingly, and although we, we do not find it to be leap year, which makes the sacrifice more meritorious, she deputes her father, the Grand Vizier, to make an offer to the king of her hand. This hand the king eagerly accepts. He had intended to take it at all events, and had put off the matter from day to day, only through fear of the vizier. But in accepting it now, he gives all parties very distinctly to understand that, grand vizier or no grand vizier, he has not the slightest design of giving up one iota of his vow or of his privileges. When, therefore, the fair Scheherazade insisted upon marrying the king, and did actually marry him, despite her father's excellent advice not to do anything of the kind, when she would and did marry him, I say, willy-nilly, it was with her beautiful black eyes as thoroughly open as the nature of the case would allow. It seems, however, that this politic damsel, who had been reading Machiavelli beyond doubt, had a very ingenious little plot in her mind. On the night of the wedding, she contrived, upon I forget what specious pretense, to have her sister occupy a couch sufficiently near that of the royal pair to admit of easy conversation from bed to bed. And, a little before cock-crowing, she took care to awaken the good monarch, her husband, who bore her none the worse will because he intended to wring her neck on the morrow. She managed to waken him, I say, although on account of a capital conscience and an easy digestion he slept well, by the profound interest of a story about a rat and a black cat, I think, which she was narrating, all in an undertone, of course, to her sister. When the day broke, it so happened that this story was not altogether finished, and that Scheherazade, in the nature of things, could not finish it just then, since it was high time for her to get up and be bowstrung. 